I'm gonna let you in right now. <laughs> oh, view? Wow. Why is everyone here early? Jeez.
Yeah. <laughs>
Hello, uh, welcome to Pacific Justice Institute's Parents' Rights Legislative Update. Uh, I appreciate you being on this uh, Zoom call. We've got uh, a lot of people still coming in and uh, we're uh, busily working to, uh, to get them admitted into the Zoom call as we speak, uh, but we're gonna cover quite a bit, a bit of information. Uh, today, uh, you know, lots happened in California specifically with regards to bills that have become law. Uh, some outrageous bills that impact our freedoms, our liberties, uh, parents' rights. Well, we're going to talk about those today and uncover and unravel some of them to understand their significance. And it's important if you're outside of California uh, to pay attention to this because what happens in California often, more often than not, spreads to other states, especially to other blue states. So uh, I'm glad you're all able to participate and uh, in this uh, very important and timely Zoom call. And I want to just open it up in prayer because at the end of the day, uh, God is our hope and our strength as we tackle these and other issues. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that uh, you are on the throne. Thank you that, uh, that nothing escapes your notice. Father, we pray for wisdom and discernment. Uh, we thank you. You've, you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and discipline or a sound mind. Father, we pray for that, all of that in this uh, discussion today. And um, we just pray for your, your peace as well as your courage as we uh, tackle these uh, new bills, new challenges to our freedoms and liberties. And also, Lord, we, always, we want to pray for those legislators um, who are confused, who are lost, who um, need direction, who need a relationship with you, Father. We pray for all of them uh, and uh, that uh, they will see uh, the air of their ways uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, we also, of course, want to pray for Israel and uh, we lift up those people, Father. We pray for victory and justice um, and protection uh, right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, I just want to first start off um, with some uh, updates. Uh, we at PJI have brought on and hired a legislative council. Now, many of you know that we at Pacific Justice Institute, we depend on religious freedom, parents' rights, sanctity of human life. We have more offices across the country, coast to coast, than any other organization of our kind. Yes, we have seven offices in California, but we also have three in New York. In fact, we have, I think, more offices on the East Coast than we do on the West Coast now. Uh, so we're all over the country uh, having a major impact and uh, not just on a federal level with federal court cases, but also on a state level. The Legislative Council is the new chapter for us in that this Legislative Council is working with our attorneys in these different states across the country and the legislatures with regards to uh, opposing uh, harmful legislation and bills, as well as promoting solid, proactive legislation and bills and having a real impact in a number of states already. Uh, it's been uh, very exciting. Those of you who wanna look at some of the positive legislation that we've put out and that we've been responsible for and had an impact on, I encourage you to go to our website and take a look at the uh, I, I will actually go to, uh, I say our website, you can actually go to, just put in Brad Dacus Live, and the, the show that we did today on hischannel.com, uh, on that show, we went into detail about a lot of these bills that were proactively engaged in across the country. Now today, we're going to focus on specific bills can becoming law out of California for a good reason, because they are horrific, and they're going to be impacting other states. So that's our focus today. But if you want some real positive stuff to look at, uh, dealing with some legislation in other states that we're engaged in, that we're partially or primarily responsible for, uh, I encourage you to take advantage of that at uh, pji.org, pji.org. If you want to receive our case updates, I encourage you also to go to our website and sign up to get the, uh, our e-newsletter, The Legal Insider, uh, pji.org. Another easy way of doing that, for those of you who are in a more you know, text oriented, you can simply text the three letters PJI to the number 71541. Now I remember that as a as being a 71 year old man having lunch with a 54 year old woman and as a one year old in the high chair. That's how I remember it. You may come up with a better way of remembering 71541 to just text PJI to that and that will automatically join you to our list and you'll be getting updates. Also, at the end, we're going to have Q&A. So uh, I encourage you, as things progress, to go ahead and put in your questions. Don't wait to the very end. 
because uh, we're going to be assimilating these questions. Our staff here right now that's helping me are going to help assimilate those questions so we can go right into them and uh, really save you a lot of time uh, to cover as much information as possible. Um, I, before we get to our Legislative Council, though, I'd like to get an update from Peter Mord. Pastor Peter Mord heads up the legal enga uh, engagement, the church engagement office for PJI up in Palmdale, California. Uh, Peter, welcome to the program. Thank you so much, Brad. And uh, we're fighting the fight at the Church Finds Its Voice under uh, Pacific Justice Institute. And there are churches all across the country that are joining, uh, linking arms, getting off the bench in the game and doing voter registration. Looking forward to this next fall. Yeah, I, I understand where we, you know, last time when we were around, we had about 500 churches do voter registration Sundays, uh, Civic Stewardship Sundays. These are fantastic. I know we're shooting for a goal of about a thousand before the 2024 election next November. So, folks, if you know of churches out there, maybe your church wants to do voter registration. It's legal. It's practical. It's demonstrating the fact that your church has a real love for people outside the church walls. That's what voting communicates, uh, especially if it's done righteously. So I encourage you to simply contact us. You can go to our website, pji.org, click churches, and you'll get information on uh, how to contact Peter Mord uh, uh, directly and, uh, and to, to connect with him. Peter, also, what's your direct email for those who want to connect with you to get their church engaged and involved? Yeah, my direct email is located on the Church Finds Its Voice tab, uh, but my last name is M-O-R-D-H, so it's just pmord uh, at pgi.org if you want to reach out to me directly. Um, we're doing lots of different uh, dozens of in-person pastors meetings in Nevada, Arizona, and uh, key districts in California. So go to that tab, and uh, we'd love to connect with you in person. Yeah, you, you've proven, in your office has proven to have real results in the last two elections, significant results impacting congressional races, um, even uh, school board races. Uh, nearly uh, two dozen school board races, in fact, had positive outcomes um, making a real, a real impact. So keep up the good work. Uh, Peter, I'd like you to uh, talk also about, um, if you could, uh, about um, Israel. Uh, this is really disturbing. Um, to what extent are the pastors and churches across America um, engaged in this, discussing this, addressing this issue? And of course, also alarming is the tremendous hate we've seen against the Jews, against you know, anti-Semitism in, in Harvard, uh, more than two dozen student groups there signing a letter just attacking Israel, blaming Israel for all the death and carnage and barbarism from the Hamas. Um, it's a real spiritual war taking place. To what extent are, do pastors recognize this? And uh, when, you, when you're done answering, it'd be also great if you could lift, uh, lead us in prayer for Israel as well. Yeah, absolutely. We're praying for Israel. I know many of us uh, stood in our pulpits on Sunday and asked our churches to pray. Uh, we've been sending support uh, to those who are on the ground, Christians, missionaries, uh, people who are helping uh, the IDF uh, soldiers. I know 14 Americans are among the 1900 that are dead in this conflict. So uh, we're praying for their families. Uh, we are going to stand unequivocally with Israel. And we are going to quote the verses in the Bible that say, God will bless those that bless Israel and curse those that curse Israel. And uh, we know that God will uh, have the last word here. And so uh, we, are, we are praying for them. And I would encourage you um, to not be silent. Uh, you know, I lead the church finds its voice. And this is one of those issues the church cannot be silent on. Uh, you must stand with Israel. And I, I believe that that's a duty that we're commanded to. We're to honor, we're to pray for peace in Jerusalem, uh, but, but we're really supposed to lift this issue up. And, uh, and so, man, I, I would love to lift up um, those families who lost their loved ones uh, in prayer right now and just uh, and pray for this uh, historic conflict. Can I do that right now, Brad? Yes, please do. Okay, let's pray. God, I just pray for uh, all the soldiers on the ground there in the Gaza Strip. I pray for... Uh, the missionaries. I uh, pray for the hundred families that are, uh, Lord, uh, just uh, really grieving in the fact that their family member has been captured, uh, kidnapped by Hamas. I pray for um, the Israeli government. I pray that their response would be swift. 
Uh, God, I pray that you would give favor to Israel in this moment. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would not stutter or stammer in our support for the nation of Israel. And Lord, I pray that if you tarry your coming, uh, that we as Americans would uh, be found faithful, uh, Lord, in uh, blessing those uh, who you told us to bless. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would please um, bless the families, Lord, and comfort the families who've lost loved ones. And I pray that you'd please help the American church, uh, Lord, to, to be a voice uh, for truth and, and a voice for Israel in this dark day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, I was out of town this, this last Sunday. I was a, across the, the country in, in Boston. Uh, but my uh, wife told me that our pastor of our church gave one of the best sermons uh, he's ever given. It was on Israel and uh, biblical perspective. Uh, it was bold. It was solid. And I just want to encourage people mm -hmm. out there, you know, there's some things that are non-negotiables. And, uh, you know, some pastors are pleasers of men, not pleasers of God. Uh, the three non-negotiables are religious freedom. That was important. If you read, read the Bible and the book of Acts, you'll see how important religious freedom is to believers to be able to share the gospel. Uh, parents' rights mm -hmm. to fight against darkness that go with their children and, and legislation that promotes darkness in, in the public schools. Um, that's a non-negotiable. The third one is, is Israel. Um, you know, we have to stand by Israel. Blessed are those who bless Israel. Cursed, cursed are those who curse Israel. And if you're going to a church where the pastor refuses to mention Israel, refuses to support mm -hmm. Israel and condemn what has happened to Israel because he, he's afraid he may offend someone in their church, um, that's a wimpy pastor. That's a pastor that's not following God. That's following men and being pleased as a man. And I exhort you to leave that church and go to a church that fears the Lord, that fears the word of God and teaches and applies the word of God unapologetically. Um, we need to do that. And I just, you know, that's just my little exhortation there. Uh, and I've, I stand not on, my, on me or my ideology. I stand on, on what the Bible teaches. And um, that needs to be our final reference point as far as I'm concerned. But uh, I, it's, it's, it's shaking up a lot of us, and I'm, I'm really glad we just made that point to, to respect Israel and to, and to get a, um, an update on what is happening within the church. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, now I'd like to move on with regards to some legislation, and I want to uh, publicly, uh, there's a lot of people and groups that were involved in this and making a difference uh, for um, you know, fighting some of these, these negative you know, bills. Uh, some of them were pushed back. Uh, I know one was vetoed, and uh, one individual in particular I want to thank is Frank Lee. Uh, he is in the San Francisco Bay Area. He's also our ambassador, if you will, for PJI for the uh, entire San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, he did considerable work uh, to mobilize people to oppose bad bills and uh, fight for good bills on a host of issues. Um, and I just want to personally and publicly thank him and recognize him for that work. Uh, Frank, uh, way to go. We really appreciate that. I know you've had an, an impact on some of these successes. Uh, but unfortunately, there are a lot of bills that did get passed that are very, very disturbing. And I want to start off with AB 1078. And I'd like to um, you know, address that this, this new law applies to, to banning uh, bans on books and other materials uh, based solely on the in, you know, inclusion of history related to to uh, different groups, including the LGBTQ. And so it's really a, a propaganda piece of legislation. And uh, I'd like to bring on now our legislative counsel who's joined our staff, uh, Janice Laura. Janice, welcome to the program. You're a, a fantastic attorney. You have great experience behind you. And uh, I appreciate the time you spent to help a look at some of these bills. Uh, this particular bill, AB 1078, um, is it as bad as it looks? Is as, as it becomes um, become law. So what, what is it as bad as it looks? It is, Brad. You used the word at the top of the hour. You said outrageous. I wrote that down because I can think of no better word <clears throat> to use to describe this bill. Um, it not only does it strip school boards of its authority, it actually imposes financial penalties if a school board doesn't do what the state of California wants it to do. And I can think of the word that also comes to mind is blackmail. Do what we say or else, or else we're going to take your funding. We're going to take away uh, needed resources for the children of your school. Yeah. Um, blackmail, I think it's a good word. Basically, 
many people see this as uh, the you know, an action by the, the state to basically take the powers away from the, the school mm -hmm. boards and say, no, uh, anything that you do with these kids, we, the state, uh, the Department of Education, we have to sign off on it. We have to approve it. Uh, it's our agenda. Basically, it, it just truncates the, the real effect of a school board, uh, as I see it, because yeah. it's their job to listen to parents, their community. It really is no longer a public school. It's just a government school. California school, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, that'll be California school. And you're taking, as you said, um, school boards, they're elected officials. They are closely held to the people. They're responsible for um, the decisions that they have to stand accountable for the decisions that are made in their communities. And this completely takes that out of their hands. It, it also sets a very troubling precedent for the state to leverage funding and to es essentially punish uh, school boards for for their actions and what what how else is this going to impact us what what else are they going to um once this moves forward are they going to try um look this in local governments outside of school boards it really has um the ability to to be far more reaching than just the school boards too yeah yeah you're right um i agree i agree 100 percent with that uh, you know janice as far as proactive things that parents can do to respond to this? Well, first, I mean, I would say, you know, parents should take their kids out of public schools if they haven't already, uh, in just about every part of the country. You know, obviously there's certain you know, circumstances, needs, situations, you know, I'm not casting a, a total blanket on this, but pretty close to a total blanket on my exhortation to parents to seriously consider taking their kids out of government schools uh, these these are major issues. These are, are real. This, these are going to impact your kids. Uh, public schools are becoming effectively spiritual death camps. So first option is to take your kids out of public schools. As far as school boards go, go though, um, public schools are still free to give notices to parents with emails, text, phone calls, hard mail, letting parents know this is what is now in our public school library this is the curriculum that's now being required they can spell it out clear cut white and black and send that out to all the parents could they not sure um be as transparent and as open and as possible provide parents with as much access to information as they possibly can maybe even um posting it on their website this is these are the, the books that we use in this grade. These are the books we use in this grade. Um, have it be as easy as possible to get that information into the hands of parents. Yeah, in fact, I, I propose that they also, with that notice, attach, say, would you like to know other al educational alternatives? Click and let them have a whole list of, the lo of private schools in the, in the area, uh, maybe charter schools. Of course, charter schools are also impacted by this, this, this same legislation, unfortunately, because they're there are also public schools, government schools, but uh, you know, also, uh, you know, these are homeschool co-ops. Um, if you want a homeschool, here's an organization you could click and get more information about, like Chia, uh, you know, Christian Home Educator Association. They can mention a few others, but the bottom line is they can proactively. They don't have to be pro-public schools just because they're on a school board. They can proactively not only give notice to the garbage, mm -hmm. but say, and by the way, here's a list of alternatives unaffiliated with the public schools that you as a parent might possibly might want to consider if you're looking for alternatives. And then, of course, the opt out forms, uh, parents can opt to, can download those straight from our website, pji.org, along with a, a book called Reclaim Your School. So if you want to have a positive impact on public schools, and if you still have your kids in public schools, you can use the opt out forms, but they're not they're not ironclad. They don't protect them from LGBTQ. It just protects them with regards to certain issues dealing with sex education mm -hmm. uh, for the most part. There's some other issues too about, you know, inqu inquisitive questions about the family, et cetera. But I encourage people, uh, we have these on almost all the states across the country. We've customized these opt-out forms for parents with kids in public schools. Please take advantage of this. If you're gonna have a child in a public school for whatever reason, take advantage of it. Go to pji.org, click parents rights, and uh, you'll you'll find it under the resources. All right, so this is horrific legislation. It's real, it's law, uh, but there's some other ugly bills 
and I want to now shift. We're going to go back to you, Janice, in a bit. But I want to now shift to uh, talk about some other uh, terrible bills. Um, and I know uh, Pastor Peter Mort has been watching these. Uh, he's uh, very involved and, in, you know, on behalf of many churches, trying to keep track of, of bills that are particularly uh, touching to them. One of them is uh, SB5, dealing with teacher training to encourage LGBTQ in, with students. Um, is, that, is that what it is, Peter? Yeah, it is. It was uh, originally a workforce bill, and they are now using this to basically provide um, an indoctrination for teachers to know how to train students on becoming more LGBTQ. And this is just one step further um, that the state's going to uh, not be all inclusive, no, to train teachers on how to uh, force this ideological, ideological bent down students throats uh, and it's it's really concerning and as a parent you know I'm, I'm very concerned um, and as a pastor of many parents when schools that this is going to happen uh, and uh, we've got to watch out for it yeah my, my concern Peter is that you know in the past we'll have a radical LGBTQ teacher and there's a lot of them many thousands of them in our public schools particularly in California uh, and some school districts may you know may not like it well this now gives every one of them a green light and then trains everyone else to say, no, you have to affirm and this confusion that this child might be going through. Even though if they're left alone, studies show more than seven out of 10 will work it through and no longer have the confusion. Oh no, the school wants to encourage this, this uh, confusion. And if it's solidified, which is what they're encouraging, then that child statistically will likely be dead before the age of 30. Uh, it's actually they have a better survival rate if they have a malignant cancerous tumor statistically of living beyond the th age of 30 than if they have affirmed and uh, this kind of gender identity dysphoria or confusion and that is what the state is mandating now by law under this new law uh, which is uh, sb5 uh, what about sb407 peter this this is ugly what's going on with this yeah, so by July 2026, every charter school and public school uh, will need to have a uh, all gender restroom. And so it'll have like the male, female, and then the, the, you know, the logo for all gender. And they want this restroom to be in every school all across the states. Let me remind everyone that there's close to a thousand school districts. I mean, this is tens of thousands of schools that we're talking about here that will be required to put this in um, and not just in high schools. Imagine a little, you know, kindergartner saying, well, what restroom is that? Why, why is that restroom have that logo? I mean, it's just, again, furthering the indoctrination and um, the forceful nature that our state is, is unequivocally just going forward with. Um, it is, it is an agenda to, to force this. And if I could say one other thing, uh, about the the bill with indoctrinating students, I believe, and and correct me if I'm wrong, Janice, but I believe that this bill also gives pretty stiff penalties for teachers who will not affirm or who do not affirm uh, LGBTQ uh, students. So, you know, again, it's 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 looking really one sided with these two bills. Yeah, and, and Janice, feel free to comment on these as well, mm -hmm. uh, as you see fit. I'm, I want you to feel free to, because uh, I know you've been watching these as well. If, um, um, anyway, so then uh, what about SB 760? Uh, this is a, a gender neutral restrooms. Yeah, so I, I mixed the two bills up, Brad. That was my fault. SB 760 is the gender restrooms. Um, the AB five is the is the teacher is the is the teacher one, um, and then the one that I was uh, talking about with the um, the next one that you mentioned, um, uh, SB. Um, let me see here. Let me make sure I, I got all the right. right. Four, it's four hundred seven. The foster 407. care. Four hundred seven. Yeah. Yeah. The, so four hundred seven is the foster care, and I mentioned that one is the restroom, but. This is where if a student is feeling LGBTQ and their parents do not 
uh, or their foster parents do not affirm them, they can be taken out of that home and placed in a more LG, L, LGBTQ uh, IE plus affirming home. Uh, and, and this opens up a whole Pandora's box of uh, how, how affirming do you have to be? Uh, what are some of the penalties for uh, students that are parents that have students that are removed? Um, so this being signed into law created a lot of questions among the uh, community of DCSF and parents that are just trying to help these, these foster kids. Uh, yeah, it's, it's tragic. Uh, once again, folks, if you have your children in public schools, look at these new laws. Look what's coming down. Look what's, you know, I, I just encourage parents to do everything they can not to wait for their child to become a casualty. Uh, once their child is confused and affirmed in this confusion, uh, it's very, very difficult uh, to be able to unwind it, especially when you have public schools and teachers pushed by the teachers union and these new laws uh, to do everything they can to brainwash these kids, to confuse these kids, to solidify that confusion. Uh, it is sick, it is inhumane, um, and it is violative of, of the social studies and the psychology reports that go uh, very much against this, uh, these actions that are being pushed on, on our children. Um, you know, before we move on to the other, other topics, uh, uh, the other bills, other, other new laws, uh, Janice, do you have any comments you'd like to make about these three that uh, Peter just uh, discussed? Oh, yeah. With regard to the uh, the foster care bill, a lot of times I read bills and they make me very angry. Uh, this just made me so sad because in addition to having a child removed from a home to be placed in a home that's more affirming, um, the training that you have to take in order to become a foster parent, you have to affirm, um, agree that there are more than one genders, agree to things that are outside of a biblical world uh, worldview. And, you know, foster parenting is hard work and it's a calling. And we have a lack of foster parents throughout the throughout the state, throughout the country. And to to take a person who believes that it's their calling and they want to give a loving home, safe, stable, loving home to a child and to say that they can't do that because they won't um, agree to going through the, the process and the training. And it's just it's really sad. And, and children are losing. Yeah, you're right. They're they're in the end of the day. That's they're the ones that are losing. Uh, also, uh, I just want people to know that um, you know if they feel directly impacted by any of these, maybe uh, you're a parent and you're you want to be or you want to be a foster parent, or maybe you are presently are a foster parent, uh, and you want to know your rights. Maybe you're interested in possibly being a, a part of a possible lawsuit challenging yeah. this new law. Uh, please contact us at pji.org. Uh, it's, it's difficult to challenge a law on its face as a general rule, just as it's written. It's much easier to prevail if you challenge it not only on its face, but also as applied to a particular person, a circumstance where you have real harm and it's spelled out real clearly before the court what they're, what's, what they're dealing with. Um, it's much more effective. We at PGI are very strategic to usually file lawsuits where we have not only challenging a law on its face, but also as applied. So if you see this applied to you, impacting you, maybe you're a foster parent, want to be a foster parent, uh, and you're interested in possibly challenging something like this in court, or would just like to know your, your rights uh, in view of this, please go to our website, pji.org, pji.org, put requests for help. Uh, we're already challenging legislation uh, like this in the Northwest. And we're, we're taking it on, you know, wholeheartedly because I think it's in the, yeah, the state of Oregon, if I'm not mistaken, they're, you know, they're, they're told that, um, yeah, no, yeah, actually it's the state of Oregon. Uh, you can't be a foster parent, you can't adopt uh, mm -hmm. if you have Christian beliefs effectively regarding uh, LGBTQ lifestyle and lifestyle choices. Uh, this is really serious uh, for government to basically purge people of faith, Christians, from being able to serve in that capacity, when statistically, a stable Christian family has a much, much better outcome uh, for the raising of foster kids than children raised in a foster home that is devoid of faith and uh, religion and um, in a constructive way. So 
Uh, if you find yourself in situations in any of these, please feel free to contact us. Now, Janice, let's talk about some other legislation. There's the SHIELD law, AB 345. What's that about and why should we be concerned about it? Well, that is, um, it provides protections for health care providers in California who um, provide abortion, contraceptive, or gender affirming care to out of state um, individuals. So, this we're really seeing an expansion of telehealth. Um, in particular with um, abortion pills. So essentially a California doctor could have a telehealth, um, a Zoom call with the patient in a state where um, these procedures are restricted, say Tennessee, and could prescri just prescribe um, the abortion pill and it could be a mail order pharmacy can send it out and um, the California will not um, they won't cooperate with law enforcement. That that is that is not considered illegal to do that. Okay. What about AB seventeen oh seven? That also is another part of the shield kind of package of laws that we saw um, recently signed into law. That um, it's so healthcare prov uh, providers. So if others if other states are going to. Um, investigate them regarding their actions, it shields them from liability or responsibility in um, California as well. And also in part of the, um, the, other, the other bill, um, California has said that they will not cooperate with out-of-state law enforcement um, and, wow. and, and won't disclose um, information to, to law enforcement regarding um, certain actions. So if something were to happen again to your underage child and you wanted to investigate it, California would not cooperate. Yeah, if a child was kidnapped from a family mm -hmm. in, in, in Texas and taken to California to change their gender, for example, cut off masochistically body parts, the kidnapper will be protected in California. If, if you, you know, that's just one example uh, of what we have to deal with. Uh, so California folks isn't just messing up California. Yes. Uh, they're going to your state, but it's abortion, uh, masochistically cutting off organs of your children to screw them up and sterilize them for the rest of their life. California has these tentacles of, of poison and death that they're trying to spread across the country. I know some states and state attorney generals will probably be challenging some of these as applied, I'm sure. AB 254 deals with um, reproductive health and sexual health digital data. Right, there's some, there was some strengthening of um, medical record privacy with regards to abortion and gender affirming care. And we saw those in the two bills, um, AB 254 and um, 352. So it makes it more difficult for, say, to, for parents to have access to information? Right, parents, right? law enforcement, um, you know, legitimate reasons um, that may come up that might, you might need that access to that information. They yeah, and they're making it almost so they impossible. Can't, they make yeah. so they can't have access to it. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, this, once again, this is the, the, you know, the enemy of the people. Uh, AB 352 enhances privacy protections for electronic medical records related to mm -hmm. abortion, gender affirming care, pregnancy loss, other sensitive services, uh, closing a major loophole for privacy protections for people traveling to California from other states. Uh, this, you know, they use the privacy protections, but in essence, uh, they make it very easy, very difficult for people to understand what's happened. And particularly if you have another state that feels that they, their lives, laws have been violated by California, it's, it's going to make it more difficult for them to, uh, to get that information. Um, another bill, which now is now law, um, protects insurers, AB 571. How does that happen? Right. It um, ensures that um, abortionists and people, uh, doctors providing gender affirming care can't have their liability insurance um, cut off based on other laws. If they're, again, if they're performing procedures on out-of-state residents, um, that they, they're, um, they can still continue to have their insurance. Okay. Uh, AB 1720. This is an interesting one. This um, requires ultrasounds to be conducted by licensed facilities. And I think that we've seen with regard to the pro-life movement um, where certain um, medical uh, 
Alternatives to a Planned Parenthood uh, provide ultrasounds to a young uh, girl, woman, to, so that they're able to see their ba their baby and, and before they make a decision that's life altering. And um, this is puts more restrictions on that. Yeah, basically, it's a cheap attempt to shut down pro-life clinics that are there to give all the alternatives, Alter the real, those who really care about women in crises, mm -hmm. uh, is to shut them down so that the baby killers, like plan in Planned Parenthood, who uh, make money selling body parts, uh, so they can just get the business. I know we at PJI are right now uh, going to bat against the, are in favor of the two largest pro-life pregnancy clinics here in the state of California. They're under barrage of discovery and other uh, you know, efforts by the state attorney general of California and his office of cronies to try to effectively shut down the pro-life clinics. Well, this law is making is going to try to make do just that, so that only the uh, the, the pro-baby killing uh, outfits like Planned Parenthood uh, can sur can survive, or hospitals that do this can survive. Um, uh, this is very tragic. We at PJI will be uh, working and assisting uh, any pro-life pregnancy clinic out there that has questions about this, uh, who uh, need uh, research or counsel on how to deal with this going forward. Anyway, I can encourage them to contact us if in that situation. Um, SB 385 allows physician assistance uh, to provide abortion care. So just a, an assistant could provide, provide abortions. Uh, not yeah, not you know, a medical doctor, right? Not a medical doctor. Just a physician assistant can go in there and cut and sometimes women have serious bleeding, serious complications. Um, this, so this lowers the standard of health care and caring for women because it's not about women, it's all about killing um, and murder. AB 1646, what does that do? Um, well, that will allow an out-of-state medical student to come to California and practice for 90 days to learn how to provide for abortions and reproductive health services and gender-affirming care. So. Yeah, how to confuse kids or affirm a confusion that leads to permanent sterilization and, and an early uh, 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 death rate. I mean, a uh, that's, uh, I mean, they, they really want to just make sure that there's no shortage of doctors willing to do that, willing to do this, to do this, this, these hideous things. Right. Right. Hi, right, Janice. Can you hear me? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. So exactly. I'm just saying that, yeah, to to affirm these 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 hideous things like abortion and. Um, yeah, it's that's horrific, horrific. Um, well, Janice, I appreciate your uh, your su summation on these. Um, it's been very helpful. Uh, I now want to open it up for some Q and A. Uh, right now, if you have some questions, uh, please send them in. We already have some right here, so and uh, hopefully uh, with Janice and Peter, we'll be able to help us uh, answer these. Uh, the first is uh, it says so many of these bills um, are unconstitutional. Why are they allowed uh, to put money and time uh, to pass? these laws why are they allowed to put yeah well it's because who's elected to office mm -hmm. bottom line uh, you don't have these bills in uh becoming law in texas in tennessee in florida uh, alabama because the people there elect legislators that don't allow it california elects a lot of evil legislators and part of that is because of people of faith who are complacent i think it's like a 40 percent voting rate who vote yes. Yep. The 60 percent who don't vote, um, the blood of the preborn are on their hands. I mean, they're, they're giving it you're acquiescing authority to evil to do evil when you don't vote. And then there's even some Christians out there. I've talked to them before. Um, I talked to one guy who said, uh, he goes, yeah, you know, I just, you know, he's, a, he's an elder in a church. And he just says, um, you know, I, I just see abortion as just just, you know, as one of many issues. Mm -hmm. And he goes and votes for a baby killer, a baby killer candidate. For president or for some other office, uh, folks, this is this is not acceptable, and it shouldn't be acceptable to the uh, for people of faith. We need to to speak it out. Um, this is the stakes are too high. The love of Christ too compelling for any of us to be complacent or uh, to be pleasers of men or to uh, allow this unbiblical worldview to to take hold of our churches or our communities. Um, what legal? Next question. What legal strategy? 
will PJI use? Well, um, I've mentioned it before, uh, not just attacking these as applied, but also on their, um, on their, not only on their face, but also as applied, that's number one. So we need people that are actually being impacted. Uh, but then what we do is we look at these laws from a number of perspectives. One is uh, to, to narrow it in terms of its application by referencing other laws, state or federal, that, uh, that may help minimize its application. We also uh, will uh, compare it with case law regarding the state constitution, not the U.S. Constitution alone, but the state constitution as well. Uh, California has a huge state constitution because they just keep passing tons of amendments, and, uh, but there's some, some gems in there that have been passed over the years, and we at PJI will use those. So we look at, in, in each state, we'll look at the state constitution we don't just, in a sloppy way, just go into federal court and just necessarily just argue uh, the U.S. Constitution. And then, of course, we do argue the U.S. Constitution and, uh, and, and constitutional case law uh, and how to, uh, to challenge it. Uh, we've been very successful. We've challenged uh, laws of work, specifically out of the state of California, effectively. Uh, there was one law that said that uh, pro-life clinics had to have a large sign in the waiting room telling women where they can get a free or low cost abortion and the phone number to call. I mean, it's like ordering Alcoholics Anonymous to have a big <laughs> sign saying where, where you can get you know, free booze. I mean, it's a total, it's a total violation of uh, the, the rights of that private uh, uh, institutions and, uh, and we won. Uh, we were the first to file the case. A number of other groups filed a litigation after we did and bottom line, it turned out very favorably. Uh, we've had other cases like that. So we're very strategic. We won't file something if we if we don't believe it has a good chance of of passing. So sometimes there's bills that some of what we've talked about that we won't be challenging court because it'll probably set a bad case law precedent. So we don't want to file a case that we know we're, we're very likely going to lose and have it set bad case law, which puts us even in a worse position down the road. Um, now, uh, our, our our private schools uh, involved in this. The good news is no. Uh, these mandates that we're talking about, as far as curriculum mandates, LGBTQ, et cetera, uh, my understanding is these are not binding on private schools, but only public schools. Janice, uh, what nope. say you? Nope, that is correct. It, right now, as the laws are written right now, it, they only affect the public schools, which doesn't mean tomorrow, <laughs> next week, next year, um, they will try to push the envelope on that. But as of right now, it is just public schools. Great. I did notice someone had a question saying, uh, asking whether they should run for school board or, you know, now or not. The answer is yes, definitely yes, because even though things have been, have been limited, you can be on that school board and you can be a voice for parents. You can give notice to parents, uh, work with, get, you know, get a majority there to give specific written notice, spelling out all the garbage in the library, in the curriculum, their activities, everything. And if parents can be just made aware of this, mm -hmm. then they can be empowered to make responsible decisions for their children. And hey, if the school district doing this garbage uh, shrinks to by 90%, great, because that's parents making that decision because they've been informed. So just being an informant as a school board member could be very valuable. I encourage you to pray about it, seek counsel, make sure you're cut out for it, uh, and that there's not someone else who might be more qualified uh, with a, a, the skill set, but. Uh, don't just be discouraged not to run because of the limitations put on school boards because of this new law. Um, Brad, can I say something about yes. that as well? Please do. Please so do. most school district uh, board members are elected by uh, a margin of around 1,200. The average number of votes it takes to win a school board district is about 1,200 votes. So sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, but these are not massive margins. And a lot of people think, man, I, I, how am I going to get 20,000 votes or whatever? The reality is when you, when you decide to run and, and, and again, you're qualified and, and you start going to the meetings and, and start learning the issues, you, you would be surprised uh, what influence you could have and change that you could affect. Yeah, yeah, you're right. And we've seen positive change. Uh, the book we have, uh, my wife and I wrote, uh, Reclaim Your School. Uh, one of the chapters is just for school board members with, you know, about two dozen model policies that they could still adopt. Um, and not just in California, but in other school uh, states as well. 
So there's still a lot of positive, proactive things that can be done to make a real impact. Um, uh, will this Zoom call be posted? The answer is yes, it will be posted. Uh, Jared, when's it, when's it expect to be posted? Today. Today? So by 2 o'clock? On the PJI YouTube, it will be posted. What time roughly? By the end, of, like by after 5? 3 p.m. By about three, three, four p.m. We'll give some. Four p.m. Right. We'll say we'll say four p.m. Uh, it should be posted, and uh, you can you can watch this. And I encourage you to forward this on to other people and other individuals so they uh, can be empowered. Uh, we have another question here. If I take my kids out of school, uh, what are my options? Of course, you have private schooling. There's some great. Uh, there are some good charter schools out there that have done a, a very effective job to meander left and right some of these these mandates um, and uh, you know I just encourage you to investigate uh, one is a, a, some a really great one in Orange County uh, it deals with classical education uh, I'm very I've been very impressed with uh, but also you can look at homeschooling uh, you can also form a, a church homeschool co-op at your church or even have one at your synagogue uh, you know a co-op for homeschoolers there's so much that can be done now, and so many parents have pulled their kids out of public schools. My understanding is this school year alone, over 50,000 children were pulled pulled out of the uh, LA Unified School District. Just this school year, over 50,000. Um, it's just tremendous, and they're looking at these options. You can make a proactive difference. Don't be complacent. Uh, we have information on our website uh, where you can get information about church homeschool co-ops. We have an article on it and a great place to go, uh, Christian Home Educator Association, fantastic play resource uh, to take advantage of that. And they've, there's, the person who heads that up is just doing a, a wonderful job. I really appreciate the work she's doing. Next question is, how do you suggest we convince our pastor to discuss these issues or have a voter registration table? The leadership's, leadership keeps saying, uh, we're not a political church. Mm -hmm. Okay. You don't have to be a political church. How about being a loving church, a caring church? Because here's my point, and make this loud and make this very clear to your pastors. Say, Pastor, if our church is truly filled with the love of Jesus, then we're going to care about people outside our church walls. And if a church truly cares about people outside their church walls, they vote, they register, and they encourage others to vote. Voting is a manifestation of whether our love is real. And if you don't think there's any history behind that, just take a look at Nazi Germany. Complacency of the church caused bombs to not only fall upon Germany, but also upon the reputation and credibility and the testimony of the church in Germany. And in the same way, those some bombs of condemnation are falling upon churches that are complacent and are pleasers of men and more interested in not offending a major tither in the congregation than they are about living the love of Christ, which includes encouraging people to vote so we can stop hideous, horrific things from happening to children in public schools, from the preborn, et cetera. Okay. Can I comment on that as well, Brad? Please do, Peter. Please, please do. Yeah. So a church is to be a pillar and ground of truth, Paul said to Timothy. And if your church is a pillar and ground of truth, you need to ask your pastor, why aren't we talking about these specific biblical truths? The fact of the matter is Jesus was conceived of the Holy Ghost. Concept life begins at conception. You know, why isn't he talking about Israel? Uh, that's all throughout the Bible. You know, some of these issues are, are label political issues and they shouldn't be, they're biblical issues. And so we're not asking churches to be political. We're asking churches to be biblical. We're asking them to get back to the principles that the Bible already talks about. So, so that's what I would just encourage you to, to, to have a loving conversation with your pastor or pastoral staff to say, can we talk about what the Bible talks about? And, and then just offer to be a part of the solution to say, hey, could I set up a table even outside to give people some of the resources or to help people register to vote? Yeah, it's, it's real easy to do. It's legal. We talk about that. And, and Peter, you and your office, church engagement office, you're there to provide all the assistance to make it really easy. Some pastors hear this and go, gosh, where do I start? You take care of that for them, don't you, Peter? 
Absolutely. It's so easy to get the registration forms. Uh, it's so easy to know exactly how to announce it, to do it through your small groups, <clears throat> to do it after a service. Um, there's a lot of ways of doing it, um, but I will tell you that the first step is just deciding we're going to do it. Right. And making making that choice. And if you're part of a church that, you know, your clergy, maybe you will feel comfortable there. But if you have a clergy that is not willing to preach the whole word of God because they're pleasers of men, you know, Galatians says you can't be both pleasers of men and pleasers of God. Uh, I encourage you, I exhort you to pray seriously about leaving that church and joining a church that respects the word of God, that teaches the whole word of God, that practices the whole word of God. The stakes are simply too high, folks. What's happening to our children? Um, the stats are horrific. Uh, they just, it, 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 you know, public schools have become spiritual death camps. If we don't elect pro, uh, the right people to the school boards, um, they're being led to slaughter. They're like sheep being led to slaughter. And that's something very positive you can do is, is deal with the school boards, getting people registered to vote. Some pastors say, oh, I'm sure all our people are registered. Oh, really? Statistics show that most pastors think that, and then they discover, uh, the study then shows that no, most parent people in the church are not registered to vote, and the majority at least do not vote. So that's the reality. Uh, you need to encourage that church as a matter of its own testimony. If they truly care, um, then they'll vote. And caring is a part of our testimony. And if you don't think the church it matters to the church, don't worry. Secular society, people in, in, in the secular world and politicians and otherwise, they're watching as to whether or not the love and the compassion and the conviction of the church is real. And they're looking at whether or not we're registering and whether or not we're voting. And frankly, I think they're justified. Um, it's, it's, it's very logical. It's very simple. Um, are, our, are pastors and churches wimps? Are they weak? Are they pleasers of men? Um, do they have elders that are compromisers to the word of God and the righteousness of God? Um, or do they have pastors, your pastor and your elders, committed to applying the full word of God on these issues that are non-negotiable, uh, like abortion, religious freedom, and support for the nation of Israel? I encourage you once again also to talk to your pastor um, before this Sunday and say, hey, can you mention something about Israel? Um, because this is horrific. And you, yeah, I noticed you didn't mention anything last Sunday. Uh, maybe, you know, lead people to pray for Israel for the, uh, because, you know, what the Bible says, God will bless those who bless Israel and curse those who curse Israel. Um, I know I personally would not want to vote for a candidate I, that I know was not resolutely in favor of Israel, uh, especially with that kind of verse in mind, uh, to be um, an enabler for, uh, for, for uh, policies and politicians that are against Israel. I would not want to be a part of that after uh, reading and understanding that verse. Um, all right, folks, we have a, a lot of questions that came in, and I appreciate that, uh, but we, we're running out of time. So um, if you uh, want to get your question answered, I want you to feel free to, uh, to contact our office, let us know. One other point, too, uh, finally, this office we opened, Legislative Council, we just opened this office. Uh, it's a major endeavor of PJI to do so. Uh, to engage in legislation all across the United States, uh, not just with an activist, but with legal expertise to help uh, pr promote positive legislation through our, uh, our office, uh, through our Center for Public Policy that we set up for, uh, by PJI. Um, I encourage you, if you want to be a part of what we're doing for churches, uh, if you want to be a part of what we're doing with legislation, go to our website, get involved, and I strongly encourage those of you who uh, want to support us on a monthly basis to become a, a regular part of what we're trying to engage in. If you haven't already done so, please do that on our website, pji.org. Uh, I don't have a scientific way to, to check, but if you've decided you want to do that, we just on the Q&A, if it's not too much trouble, just say, hey, uh, Brad, I've decided I'm going to become a regular monthly supporter. Uh, that means a lot to me and a lot, and I'm sure a lot to, to Janice and the others who are engaged in the, in the, the, the trenches uh, to, to know that people are not only hearing this, but they're responding. It's very, very encouraging. So if you want in the Q&A, if you want to do that, just, just send a little note. Um, it means a lot to myself and the others uh, just to know that these shows, these, these Zooms are um, not just recruiting listeners, but people who are joining us in the, in the fight. 
So I just go in the Q&A, say, yes, I'm going to become a monthly supporter of any amount. That means a lot. Anyway, God bless you, and uh, let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you and praise you that you're on your throne. Thank you, Lord God, that you um, know every nook and cranny of Israel and of Gaza and Iran and, and this the whole uh, mess that's going on in the Middle East. Father, we just pray for you to be glorified. Uh, we pray, Lord God, for your grace, your mercy, and your power uh, to be displayed and, uh, and uh, for your, your kingdom but to be uh, to, to come up through the ashes, to be for light among darkness, to shine in this terrible situation. We pray for our nation, Lord. We pray, Lord God, that you will uh, give each of us, Lord God, a heart of conviction of what you want us to do, how you want us to do it, where you want us to do it. Uh, but Lord, most importantly, let us not be complacent. Lord God, let the love, your love overflow us to be involved, uh, to be active, and most importantly, not to forsake the gospel to a world that is desperately in need of knowing your hope, your truth, and your salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. We give the praise and glory now for all that lies ahead and our confidence in you. In Jesus' name, amen. So folks, thank you for joining us. We're here to serve you without charge. At any time, let us know. And remember, no matter what we're facing, no matter what the trial, always, always keep the faith.